Today I will talk about algorithm design with the selection monad. And yeah, so um, I'm intending to start slowly because uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the selection monad, but um, when I first saw it, it uh, was uh, kind of overwhelming and confusing to me what it actually does. So I want to give you an intuition on how that works and what the magic is behind. So let's start about thinking about selection functions. So we have something um, uh, similar to like this Maxwell function that given a collection of A's and something, some judgment to judge each individual A in, in, and transform it into an R, while R is an ordered type. So we have some sort of uh, judgment there. We can um, select out of the collection an A. And with this Maxwell function, we select the A that um, is producing the, the maximum R value. So if you think of R as an integer and A's of, I don't know, cars or whatever, then we transform each car into some integer and then take the car that produces the biggest integer. We could, for example, use top speeds or whatever and then select the car with the greatest top speed. And then we can abstract and define actually the type um, from the selection monad type, which is JRA, which abstracts over the uh, later part here, which is given a judgment from A to R, I select you an A, and with that type we can rewrite the Maxwell function in that way. That's just rewriting, there's nothing fancy going on there, I hope you can follow. <laughs> and yeah, so. The next question would be, what can we do with selection functions? So, let's start simple. We can build a pair. We can build a pair of selection functions. A pair operator that takes two selection functions, one of type JRA and one of type JRB, and produces a new selection function of type JRAB. So much for the type. So, how do we actually implement such thing? So, given the two selection functions, I call them F and G, which F is JRA and G is JRB. We need to produce a JRAB pair. And if we recall from previously, the, the type is um, actually something that takes an argument and produces something, so it's actually a function type. Uh, if we go further, um, we can already have an, a judgment P here that judges AB pairs and, and into us, and then what we need to return in the end is an AB pair. So given these three things, even though the type suggests there are only two things, um, we, produce a, we need to make an AB pair. So the question is, how, how do we going to do that? How do we get there? Um, so we need, for a pair, we need an A and a B. And the only thing that can give us A's and B's are F and G. F produces an A if we give it some sort of judgment and G produces a B. So we need to get an um, start here. We need to get, um, to, in order to get an A, we need to apply F to something. And we do, if we go, um, bam, or if we remind ourselves, JRA is something of type A to R. So given the function from A to R, then it returns as an A. So we need to build that function from A to R. We use that. Um, we, use, um, we build a function, we use it um, in Haskell as a lambda, while x is of type A. Now we need to produce an R. We are at the point where we want to have an R to judge that A. We can't, but we don't have a function that um, goes from A to R. We only have something that goes from pairs, um, from A, B pairs to R. So we apply our function P we have from here um, to a pair. We have the first part of the pair. We have something of type X, which is um, um, an X of type A. And next, we um, need a, something, a Y of type B. And uh, we get that out of G. So we apply G to, again, um, again, a judgment function. We build that judgment function. So suppose we have a Y. Um, we then have. Um, a full pair which we can apply our P to we have um, from the beginning. And that whole thing then gives us an A. And, and now we have an A. 
And in order to get a B, we get a B out of G, and we do the same trick as we did over here. We, uh, we have a Y, and we apply our P to, in this time, A and the Y. So, at least when I saw this definition first, we kind of constructed it now. Some people follow, some people are still surprised by the magic. Well, why is that working? What is it actually doing? And what helps me, what is a good intuition for that, is think of selection function as something that have already some sort of um, collection built in. So they are already pre-applied to a collection. So they contain some set of elements, and they just wait for a judgment to judge these elements in order to produce, to select one out of its collection. And what we do here is, um, okay, to get an A out of this collection, um, um, out of the underlying collection of F, we need to build a judgment, and we can not judge um, A's individually, we need to judge them in context. We need to judge them in pair context, because we only have something that judges pairs. So we go through each element that is in the underlying set of A, um, JRA, and um, we look what would be the best, the optimum B for this individual element. And then um, we select the um, X of type A, which is, produces the best overall pair. So what we do, in, in, if we think, um, think of sets, is we build the Cartesian product of both underlying sets of JRA and JRB and select the best pair in the end. Uh, to follow up on this, I have an example, a very artificial one, but suppose we want to crack a secret password. A password that, in this case, contains um, is a pair of a secret integer from 1 to 9 and a secret character from A to Z. So, and we are given a P function that tells us if a given password is the, um, the secret one, and it's very straightforward. If like, our password in this case is where the integer is seven and the uh, character is S, um, it returns true if that is the case. If um, if that's not the case, it returns false. And if we look at this P now as a black box, so. Of course, if we write it out, we know the password, but if we are given that as a black box, we can't look inside. We now want to use, utilize selection functions and the pair for selection functions to crack this password. So, um, what we need, we need two, um, or we split um, the task in two selection functions. One that selects the integer and one that selects the character. So we have the select int character, we have the max with function from before, we pre-apply it to a list from 1 to 9, because that's all the options. And then um, we have the same for the character. That's a typo. I'm sorry, that should be A to Z, not Z to Z. Uh, <laughs> but yes, um, these are our selection functions. And indeed, with these selection functions, if we build a pair of these two selection functions and give it a P, it actually selects our secret password, so 7 and S. Uh, I hope it's clear by now why it does that. Um, and yeah, that is one, I mean, like that, that's a start on how to get an uh, approach on what, what selection functions and then later the monad does. So to extend that, what would be the next logical step going from pairs to a sort of product? So uh, we now have a list of selection functions uh, of any length and we want to build a selection function that uh, uses um, and that, that selects as a list of elements. And um, some people might already know um, that is, if we think of J as a monad, that is sequence for monads. And the idea is kind of the same, but in code, in, 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 in the implementation, it looks different. So we now have a list of stuff, so we do the basic list recursion thing we do with lists all the time. Uh, we have a base case, so in, in, um, in case our list, of selection um, our list of selection function is empty, then we only can select the empty list. And given we have some, um, uh, something in there, what we want to do is get an uh, A out of the first selection function and then call ourselves recursively on the rest. So given we, um, our, our list of selection function is not empty, we, do some, uh, we get an A, 
and then we have a recursive call for the rest. And what it in the end looks like is that long thing, but um, believe me, it does the same thing as the pair. To get an E out of, um, 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 to get an A out of E, we need a function, a, a, a judgment function, and this judgment function needs to judge the individual objects, underlying objects of E, but it needs to do um, this in a context with all future, um, um, all possible futures in mind. So we call ourselves recursively in there. We look, so so we look at our um, our x, our element, and we look into the future and see, well, what um, what could be, given that x, what could be um, the the best future, and then in the end um, we have this little bit, which is a bit of magic, which um, uh, prepends our choice. So we thread through um, previous choices. So we, we call ourselves recursively not with the same p, but with a p that already knows what has been selected before. And we do the same thing in our recursive call here. So that is a cons um, before p. So we cons our pa and we cons the past in front of it. I hope yeah, that's clear. And yeah, I'm, um, yeah, um, that that gives us a product. So looking at the password example again. Now password is more complex. Password is a string. We assume we know the length of the string because that makes things easier for the example. Uh, the password is one of the safe ones. It's password, and uh, we can note that our p here is only defined for strings of length eight. If we call it with another string, with a, um, a string that is not of length 8, we get an undefined error. Uh, that later illustrates, so if we use the product of this time select character, we replicate it 8 times, so we have a list of 8 times the same selection function, and then make the product out of it and give it this p, it returns password. And what I said here, it, it's only defined for characters of length 8, so P is only um, always called with all past choices and all future choices in mind. Never in this product um, environment there will um, P will be called uh, on uh, incomplete solutions. So so we all we um, we get um, we judge individual objects of these underlying select char selection function always in context with future and past. Okay. Uh, let's st stay here for a um, short amount of time. So what, I've, um, what I told you up till now is already known and has been described in the context of sequential games. Um, and it turns out that this product for selection functions um, works well uh, in the context of sequential games or generally in the context where you do an exhaustive search on all possible solutions. Uh, it, it's basically a brute force approach. What it does is tries out every string with any um, every character, uh, any every possible string um, of length eight, and then once it gets uh, the right one, it returns that. So there's nothing fancy, no magic going on. It just is a very short and neat way to write down this algorithm. And um, yeah, what I also um, the talk is called selection monad, but I will skip the monadic part. <laughs> Because <laughs> why I, I can tell you find me later I tell you how to make this instance of a monad but it's the same logic going on behind like this written out is um, I can also write um, as a monad and um, use usual standard library sequence for it and um, my, to answer the question why because I think it's easier to understand what's going on than when I hide it behind a monad the monadic interface to, to get an intuition about what's going on because what I want to talk about um, is uh, what else could I do? I, can I do um, something, uh, can I do different algorithms uh, except exhaustive search? That's why it's called algorithm design. And something I came up with is um, I can do greedy stuff. A greedy algorithm um, is basically something that judges object and selects object based on past choices, but it's not looking into the future. It makes locally optimal choices 
And then the magic of a greedy algorithm is that the problem is structured, or the problem is in a way that it works, that you make locally um, a lo local optimal choices and get an op lo um, optimal solution in the end. So uh, the magic is in the problem. So some problems can be solved with greedy algorithms rather than a full exhaustive search. And the greedy product looks much simpler. It just skips the whole looking into the future step and looks at the object individually. And because we are um, keeping track of the past, we know the past, and um, we don't do something fancy. Uh, extending this to the secret password example now, um, we need a different um, property function, P, which now term works on partial solutions as well and makes progress on partial solutions. So we have something that um, tells us and um, gives us back an integer and basically tells us how many characters of a given string are the right one in the right place. So, so if I have a string that has the starts with P but has nothing to do with the rest, it gives me a 1. If P A is correct, then it gives me a 2. And with that P, we can use, utilize the greedy product because we don't need to know the future to know which is the optimal character at a, a given stage of the password. And that does the same thing. So um, what we can see and what is um, nice about this is that we uh, the, the structure is the same. So we still use the same sort of selection function, the same list of eight selection function. We just um, now have, we not just need to make sure our problem works with a greedy algorithm and then we can utilize a greedy product and have uh, yeah, we have a huge um, performance improvement by <laughs> doing it the greedy way. We can also swap greedy product with product, and it does the same thing, the same solution, but it is exponential instead of uh, linear, which is cool if you want to do more stuff with the selection monad. And then there are further products you can think about. So in the context of sequential games, if you want to play chess, you can think of a selection function as something that, as a given stage of the game, sel um, selects the best move out of all possible moves. And to do that, um, you kind of need to know the state of the game. So, so we have history-dependent selection functions. So that is the history of um, previous choices. And from that, we can compute what moves are possible and select the best one. And for that um, to, to work, we need a history-dependent um, product which I don't show the implementation now. I have two minutes, I just saw. Uh, but um, it's kind of the same thing. We just thread through history. Another thing which might be useful and is straightforward to implement is a limited look-ahead product, a product that looks n steps into the future instead of looking into the whole future. Because uh, you could just cut off. You have a counting variable and you cut off uh, your look-ahead into the future. Um, and yeah, in my paper I present uh, this in them with um, some some examples and may, um, show show that in greater depth how these further products work. And um, further, you can also um, think of something. Right now, we have the limitation that we need to know the length of the solution. We need to know that the password is eight characters long. But you could also thread through a predicate that tells you when to stop when we reach the final solution. Uh, so, so we have a uh, iterated product. We, or, yeah. Um, so there are many more products that might be useful in the context of um, the selection monad, and um, that result in different algorithms. And some future work for me. Uh, I'm done, but I can give you uh, some some look ahead. What I want to do uh, work on next is make the exhaustive search more s um, smarter. So see if um, in uh, sequential games there's something called alpha-beta pruning where you prune parts of your search, uh, which you can do under certain conditions, and um, to make that smarter and th therefore um, perform better. Okay, yeah, that was my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you very much. Uh, before we proceed to questions, there is one more person I'd like to introduce to you. This is Victor. You don't have to... Welcome him with a round of applause, please. 
Um, he's a volunteer here. He's going to ask you what did you think about the talk. So he's going to go around the room, hand you over the tablet, and you can press the green uh, button here. <laughs> um, so now, questions, please. Uh, thanks for the talk. So I have a question regarding uh, the, on average, the performance, right? So is it possible with that already plug some sort of randomization so that uh, on average, maybe it performs better instead of trying on, or it, it, do I, did I make myself clear? Yeah, yeah. Uh, performance is a huge issue. Um, I can only um, say negative things about that because um, there, are only, there are more performance issues on, the, on that product uh, than I uh, admitted. So if we go back to that product here, what we do is, um, for example, we uh, for, for the first element, we um, compute all possible futures for each element, and then we do a recursive step where we forget that we computed all that future uh, and do it again. So there is some there, there are many points where you um, can be way smarter than that. Some, some points are hard to get um, in pure functional languages. Some then that's what I'm currently trying out. What, what can I do with memorization to counter that problem? Where can I prune? What you're saying is um, with randomization of the input, that only works if you're actually pruning parts of your search tree. If you're looking at the search tree completely, it doesn't matter in which order your input is. But if you start pruning, yeah, then you can start um, randomize or use heuristics to, uh, and that's the idea of alpha, alpha beta pruning, alpha beta pruning. I think on random order cuts of one third of the tree, but you can be really efficient by cutting off more by having a heuristic that sorts your tree in a way. So, so yeah, there's possibility to do it, but it hasn't been done yet. Uh, thank you for the talk, it was really nice. I was wondering if there is some subclass of problems for which we know that this will perform well and it will not suffer from some uh, some issues because it seems to me that this problem with password works nice because it just it if it if it fails on the first letter then it somehow can immediately exclude a given letter and just move on is that correct so so if we are talking about the product here I sh have shown you there's nothing smart going on I don't think there is a any sub project um, sub problem a set of sub problems that is um, it can do anything smart on if we, but what my point of this whole talk is to show you we don't need to do an exhaustive search on everything if we have a problem that works greedily then i'm convinced that this actually is a pretty straightforward and a good solution to greedy um and um, um, to a greedy po um well, not a problem but a problem that can be solved with a greedy algorithm uh, that is linear time. We don't do anything twice. We we don't um, we don't discard any computation. So that would be your subset I identified. Okay. Really <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt such an interesting discussion. We have time for just one more question. So, but please be brief, and we have to set up another speaker. Uh, does R always have to have a, to a total order, or can it be partially ordered? Sorry, say it, say it again. The R type, does it need to have a total order or can it be partially ordered? The, the R type um, doesn't need to be uh, ordered in any way. It depends on your selection function. So what I showed you as an example uh, was this MaxWith function in the beginning. Uh, there it can be partially ordered. Can, um, it really depends on what selection function you want to utilize. What you can also do is um, have selection function that return constant elements. So the type, the, the selection, the selection monad type here doesn't restrict R in any way. It's just that if you want to solve certain problems, you want to have R somehow ordered or it some makes some sense out of this R. Can be anything. Uh, can be arbitrary complex, can be arbitrary simple. The simplest one you can do is um, ignore your P and just return a constant A. Um, and uh, that still works with the product and it's still a monad. Just, it's not really useful. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. I think the answers deserve another round of applause. No? <laughs> Thank you.